Okay, can I hear it again for Sister Yas? Yeah. Uh, we're so happy to see all of you present. And uh, when people learn that uh, I work with Sister Iliasta, the inevitable first question is, what is she really like? And so I'm going to tell you this morning from an insider's perspective, Iliasa Fatima Shabazz is the third daughter of Minister Malcolm and Sister Betty Shabazz. Iliasa received her master's degree and she received her Bachelor of Science degree. But that's not what drives her. She has served as the um, Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Mount Vernon. That's not what drives her. Ilyasa has walked with presidents. She was a member of President Clinton's United States delegation on the historic tour of uh, South Africa to celebrate the uh, presidency of Nelson Mandela. That was important, of course. That's not what drives her. What drives her? Within her beats the very heart of Shabazz. As the daughter of Minister Malcolm and Sister Betty, Ilyasa loves her people, our people, unconditionally. What also drives her, a personal, professional commitment to help each of us be the best that we can be. And so with that commitment, she produces, for example, the Wake Up Tour, a unique youth empowerment program that she has often produced from her very own pocket to help youngsters be exposed to community leaders, people in business, politics, the arts, entertainment, to give to them a blueprint for success. It is with the commitment to help each of us be the very best that we can be that she serves as the president of the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Memorial Cultural and Educational Center at the place of her father's assassination at the Audubon Ballroom. And she does that again because she wants each and every one of us to be the very best that we can be, understanding that if we know her father and know of his work, then we can aspire and we can be all that we can be. And, I, and just so that you know, it's not just my perspective, but I have the privilege also to stand with her in the presence of Brother um, Benjamin Kareem. And as you knew, he had the place of honor at her father's side. And as we were present at a presentation, and I, and I almost forgot to say, uh, her commitment leads her to speak at um, situations like this one. But Brother Kareem observed that as he stood and listened to Ilyasa, he was reminded of her father and his ability and his presence. And so without further ado, I bring to you our sister, Ilyasa Fatima. <laughs> That was very nice. Thank you, Linda. Gosh, Linda's never done that before, so I think I'm going to keep her with me on the road. I don't know if, if you know that malaria is the number one killer of African children and that it's not AIDS. And that goes to say that it really is our responsibility to not only take care of ourselves and our children here, but to be concerned about our uh, the indigenous people of Africa, which is where our ancestors come from. Because if malaria is the number one killer and it's not AIDS, and we know that AIDS is wiping out millions upon millions and millions of children, and then you find out, find out that malaria is killing even more children and there is a cure, it's just a mosquito bite, then there is something wrong, and, and so we have to really step up and do our part. So um, I think it's, uh, I'm gonna have to keep bringing Linda around and not depend on this little DVD that I can play. Uh, Director Siddiqui Cambon, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's probably not good morning now, good afternoon. Still good morning. I'm very happy, humbled, and honored to be with you today at the 22nd Annual Malcolm X Memorial and Awards Breakfast to celebrate our heritage by commemorating the life and legacy of my father, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, and to award those activists among us who continue in our foreparents' footsteps to carry the torch of activism forward because it's something that we all should be doing. A few years after my mother passed away in 1997, I had the opportunity to reflect on the characters of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz when I wrote my coming of age memoir, Growing Up X. I was able to reflect upon the values both my parents found important in raising their children. It was important to my parents that I knew who I was as a woman and who I was as a person of the African diaspora. And as such, I learned about the lessons of service 
and I learned to live a purpose-driven life. Most people don't realize that my father was just a young man when he took a stance against institutionalized racism, institutionalized oppression. Brother Malcolm was just in his 20s when he stood against the power and might of the United States government and demanded justice primarily for every breathing African American and ultimately for every breathing soul oppressed and or repressed around the globe. And I also want to acknowledge my cousin back there, Ronnell Collins, when my father came to um, Boston to live with his elder sister, Ella Collins, uh, of course, he had the honor and pr uh, privilege of being raised uh, with his young cousin, uh, nephew, actually, uh, Ronnell. <laughs> Ronnell is also the author of my nephew Malcolm's favorite book about his grandfather, uh, Seventh Child. And he was the one who encouraged me to read it from beginning to end. Thank you. But like you, Brother Malcolm didn't wait for some other person to care about our children and our elders. He didn't wait for someone else to meet the needs of the downtrodden members of the African diaspora. My father was just in his late 20s when he hoisted humanity on his shoulders and carried us forward toward a more egalitarian future. Most people don't realize that my father was so young. You know, we look at Malcolm X and we think that he was in his 50s or something, but we don't compare him to our age. And really younger than a lot of people who are here, who are here today. Not by, not, not by much, of course. Just a little bit. But Brother Malcolm gave us so much of himself to the cause of social justice at such a young age. Certainly, this is a young man filled with great compassion a man of great integrity to take on such a load for us. And so 44 years after his martyrdom, Brother Malcolm remains a role model for those around the globe advocating for social justice. He continues to inspire individuals from all backgrounds, ethnicities, and nationalities to truly believe in equality and freedom as attainable and alienable rights intended for all of humanity. Those are the rights of a human being that's written in the Constitution. In fact, after 400 years of psychological trauma, because you must understand it was psychological trauma to live your entire lifetime oppressed by, you know, this psychologically traumatizing, and we can't forget that. I've had the honor and pleasure to hear from many men of the African diaspora, many men and women of color, including President Barack Obama, that one of the greatest gifts Brother Malcolm gave to them was a sense of pride and purpose. As one grapples with the injustices, with the apparent institutionalized racism that instilled an inferiority complex, making us feel less than what we are, not liking our blackness, choosing a different mate, you know, perhaps instead of choosing a mate who looks like you or your mother, you choose someone else, or you know, who looks like your father, choose someone else. but it instills an inferiority complex because of one's blackness and one's Africanness. That Brother Malcolm gave to them their identity. That he spoke to the core of one's humanity and he empowered a people with the richness of their history. That whether we were in the Caribbean, South America, or here in the US, Brother Malcolm informed us that we were of African descent, all of us. That we descend, you know, sometimes we're like, well, you know, I'm not really African, I'm Indian, and I'm all these other things, but even Indian people come from Africa, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But that we descended from a place called Africa, all of us, the place in, of which the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, even the Dead Sea Scrolls boast. The place of the most advanced civilizations ever recorded in history. That he articulated for the listless a sense of pride, greatness, and belonging sufficient to support a more purpose-driven life. You see, Brother Malcolm read everything you can imagine. Newspapers, magazines, biographies, histories, the dictionary, the encyclopedia. He read the classics, anthropology, African history. This is time that you have, this is work. And this is what he did willingly. African history, the origins of religion, anything by or about people of color. He was so widely read and so brilliant that he was able to truthfully educate a miseducated nation about its history. 
Brother Malcolm restored our history with integrity. After nearly 400 years of psychological trauma, including the miseducation about Africa and her people, Brother Malcolm told us that we were the characters in those holy scriptures. He told us that we were the architects of those magnificent monuments, the steles and the pyramids. That we were the architects of ancient civilizations thriving at its peak. That we were those scholars, astronomers, and physicists. Brother Malcolm replaced the limitation and hopelessness associated with the Jim Crow identity and replaced it with the grandeur and expansiveness of Pan-Africanism. And that's that we are supportive of each other, we acknowledge the greatness of each other, and that we understand who we are. He demonstrated to us that in every aspect, black was in fact beautiful, because we really didn't think it was. He fought against racism and oppression and restored knowledge. And I have to say, the reason we didn't think it was is because of that, you know, the enslavement and the miseducation process, as we know, you know, the blacker you are, the, 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 the worse um, your life was, the lighter you are, the more privileges you had, and, and, and of course, we all are aware of that. He fought against racism and oppression and restored knowledge of our identity, clouded by years of inhumane racism. Brother Malcolm was a man of great compassion, a man of impeccable integrity. Just a very young man, because there are so many people who say, oh, you know, I was with Malcolm because Malcolm was for violence. I was with Malcolm because Malcolm did all these things. He had impeccable integrity. He cared for us. He fought against out the injustices committed. If you remember, you see fire hoses being extinguished on women, on children, on helpless men. You see people, you saw Bro Brother Siddiqui, he told us he got hit with a brick. <laughs> you know, fighting nonviolently, protesting, marching nonviolently. So Malcolm had compassion for us. He was a man of great integrity. He didn't cheat on his wife. You know, he didn't do anything illegal. He was just a great, great man. He showed us that, if, and I don't say it because he's my father, I observed his life. And if you listen to J. Edgar Hoover, then you're gonna think that this man was a radical, you know, a man that advocated so much. But Malcolm contributed significantly to us, for us. He showed us that empowerment is the reward of Pan-Africanism, that empowerment is the result of loving ourselves, trusting ourselves, networking amongst ourselves, and we heard him. We embraced his message. The pros were mighty, and the fists were tall. And if we are to complete the journey, if we are to leave a better world for our children and for our grandchildren, then we must hear him again. Siddiqui said the, the line was wrapped around the college, so we have to ensure that the line continues to be wrapped around the college with young people. You see, Brother Malcolm culturally revolutionized a nation and its people, and he left his indelible mark on the international struggle for justice. For the first time in their entire lives, for almost 400 years, when black men and women were indoctrinated to believe that they came from nothing, ordained by God to be nothing, heard complimentary and accurate facts about who they were as men and who they were as men of African descent, because they had never heard anything other than being a slave. And so it would be undoubtedly a tragedy should we continue to allow our history to be taught anywhere in the world without telling the accurate history of ancient Africa and the history of Africa's remarkable diaspora, Africa's significant contribution to world history. Internationally renowned scholar Sheikh Anta Diop, based out of the University of Dakar in Senegal, West Africa, postulated the mono, I see I was a biology major, so all this stuff means something to me. <laughs> Know, the monogenetic theory, when I was ta talking about that, she was like, you don't need to talk about that. But the monogenetic theory says that we, that we came from one. The polygenetic theory is what is not accurate, and that's what is, um, you know, people are told, right, that they came from Asia, that, you know, first man came from Europe, and, you know, all these different things, when the first man did not do all that. So, um, Sheikh Anta Diop uh, uh, postulate the monogenetic theory that man only evolved from Africa and migrated to different parts of the world. And this is a very huge uh, uh, presentation. It is the birth of civilization for all human existence. That the continent of Africa, which boasts the most advanced civilization ever recorded in history, 
gave rise to all others that we African people throughout the sub-equatorial region of Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, it's this little area, well, it's not little, it's pretty, pretty big, T almost 20, well, at least 20,000 years ago, and we were dependent upon melanin, that is to say, black pigmentation, for survival. This is sun, you know, the sub-equatorial, you know, all this biology stuff. And that these forefathers of the world's population, because we must understand that they contributed tremendously when you see that some of those uh, structures are still standing and they cannot be replicated. That these, you, you have to look at the people that were actually building these things and have to study to, to do these things. That the forefathers of world population, the founding scholars, farmers, architects, and physicists migrated to different parts of the world and that due to different climatic phenomenon, glaciers and all that kind of bio biological stuff, that they began to take on different looks like in Asia and Europe. Sheikh Anta Diop concluded that if we had not left the continent of Africa, all of man would be homogeneous, meaning one. That is, have one African look, and the rest of the world would have been a desert. So there's so much to be proud of, and there's a reason why we were enslaved. We weren't enslaved because we were listless and couldn't do anything, or because we were starving and, and the continent was in ruins. The continent is in ruins today, not complete ruins, but so many parts are in the condition that it's in because you took so many millions of people out. So you see, we are all brothers and sisters. Whether you're black, white, red, yellow, green, orange, we are all of one. And so today in this millennium, it should be unacceptable for us to allow them in documentations about ancient civilizations to discuss the Greeks and Romans only, while black-skinned Africans are cast off as slaves or servants, if even in existence. Because a lot of times when we see those ancient documentaries, we don't even see black people in them. And it should be unthinkable for us as clear-thinking adults to permit the portrayal of these founding fathers and mothers as people who clearly are not black-skinned African people, because our children deserve to feel proud of their heritage as well. Right. Because any one of these smart per persons here must have questioned at some point in your life if you've heard all of these things, how is it that the Nubians, the Ethiopians, the empires of Mali, Nabit, Timbo, Timbuktu, and all the ancient black kingdoms with all their majesty and grandeur, which to this day have never been able to be replicated, even though they show you these new images of the people who were building all these things, and they never looked jet black, but they were jet black. How is it that this rich history is omitted and never mentioned? It's our responsibility to change it. Surely you must have questioned this at some point in your life when you see the billions of Africans on the continent, the antiquity of magnificent structures. It's our responsibility to right the wrongs, and it's our responsibility as conscious, self-empowering people to correct the history books and inform the world of our history, especially for the sake of our children. But since we have not seized our power fully, and have instead acceded in the distortion of our history, because we may not be aware, because we haven't been able to do that research like Brother Malcolm did, but his life shows us at such a young age that you can go and do that, and it's extremely important because that's what life is all about. It's not about coming here and just existing and, and enjoying, but you have to also contribute while you're existing and enjoying. So it's not surprising then that this, the descendants of African people are viewed as inferior and the descendants of the Greeks and Romans are viewed as superior. And it's not surprising that systemic and prolific injustice would be the end result. When we went to Jordan and we went to all these ancient, you know, to see all these ancient uh, ruins, which are absolutely magnificent, we had a, 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 a historian with us who was giving us all this information, telling us about who built it, what was it like, and so forth. But everything that he said was, when there was something magnificent and grand that the Romans came and made it better. And that's the story, for the most part, when you go to the ancient you know, world, that all, they all believe that the Romans came and made it better instead of acknowledging that our ancestors, you, ha you have to be black if you don't go from white to black, but that there were black African people in all their grandeur and, and the, the greatest intellect ever who created all of this. And it's really important, you know. So let me say it again, that my father raised the consciousness of humanity to understand that our forefathers were not 
simply slaves, but were in fact the upstanding scholars of African antiquity who cultivated the world. They were not simply slaves, they were African men, women, and children in bondage. They were African people in bondage. It's very difficult for me to just say, to, when people say, oh yeah, you know the slaves, they used to do this, they used to do that. And when we say that, it's, we remove ourselves from the feeling or the trauma that they endured for us. You know, that all that they contributed, that this is, a lot of these uh, places around the world would not have been cultivated without the work of these African people in bondage. But before that, people. They were the African men and women who had in fact built those great civilizations whose stories are erroneously reconstructed and depicted even to this day. He taught us that long before there was a Harvard or a Yale, there was the University of Timbuktu. There was the University of Alexandria. And that learned and distinguished African men and women conferred degrees upon citizens of the world. And it was these young men and women, these founding fathers and mothers of great civilizations who were dispersed around the globe in bondage. And I think we really should understand that if anyone ever saw the story of uh, Sinke, you know, he came and he saw a lot of paganism. And he was able to contribute so much to the plantation and spoke five different languages. That was common, the way African people were back there. But remember, such a large uh, landmass. You see, when Africans of the diaspora were at our lowest point, oppressed, miseducated, misled, and psychologically traumatized after 400 years, rightfully so after 400 years of bondage, my father had the courage and the compassion to stand up for us and challenge a governmental system that perpetuated injustice and thrived upon the systemic miseducation of its citizens. Brother Malcolm, just a young man himself, had the compassion to care for us. He had the integrity and faith in God to challenge a governmental system, a government that had been historically unjust. He would teach all of us that contrary to what societies have espoused over the centuries, that Africa's contribution to world history predates the enslavement of black people, that Africa's greatest contributions to world history predates the bondage of African people, and that together all of us, black, white, red, yellow, green, and brown, must subscribe to higher standards for ourselves, and that we must empower ourselves through truth and education, as well as through the participation of the political process to re remove the remaining vestiges of social justice wherever it exists in the world. Are you with me? Just about six months ago, on November 4th, we all participated in America's political process. And by a show of hands, how many of you here voted? Congratulations, it just goes to show the power we possess if we're focused and if we persevere, because I know, I didn't even believe it was gonna happen. You know? I didn't, you know? <laughs> and then you realize there really is a God, because you just say, if George Bush took it, Two terms, he stole the presidency. We know that he stole the presidency, and we didn't do anything about it. How is this black man going to really win? And so it was really, you know, a law of You know, it, it, it shows that there is a God and that, you know, the rites of passage and all is, is in line. So um, I've never witnessed such worldwide interest and pure elation regarding the election of a U.S. president. Have you? No. And I know that my father would share in the joy regarding President Obama's impressive, because it was extremely impressive victory because of the prospect of elevating the United States to a position of credibility and respect in the world because the U.S. Had, wasn't getting a whole lot of respect when you traveled outside. And you weren't gonna get a whole lot of respect being an American person, so you had to dress up like the countries that you were visiting so that, you know, you just had to be protected. But I'm certain that my father would extend his hand in service and in support of our president's agenda and initiatives to empower citizens of the United States and the world in the exercise of their God-given human rights. That is, people who are being oppressed and, and suffering you know, tremendously that uh, my father would support uh, Barack Obama's, President Barack Obama's initiatives to uh, address these things. Because you see, when I look at President Barack Hussein Obama, I see a young man very much like Malcolm X. People used to compare him to Dr. King, and I love Dr. King. We were very close to the family. But really, President Barack Obama is so much more 
identifiable to Malcolm X. Now, I don't say it because he's my father, but it's just a fact. You know, uh, Barack Hussein is not a um, pastor or reverend, but you know, I, I, and I'm not saying anything negative, of course, because I really do. I mean, our family is also an extreme because we were raised together, the King family and the Shabbat family. A lot of people don't know that. They think we're supposed to choose one or the other. And if someone says something negative about Dr. King to me, it's, it's quite offensive. So understand that I'm not saying that. But when I see uh, Barack Hussein Obama, I truly see a young man very much like Malcolm X. Hardworking, willing to put himself and his family on the line. And to get a better picture, my father was a little more than half our president's age when he took a stand. People say that he changed, that Malcolm X changed after he made Hodge. But he didn't change, he evolved. My father, Brother Malcolm, was clearly a man of impeccable character and integrity. And he married a woman with similar values and ideals who would also aid the movement. Betty Shabazz was poised and she possessed beauty, grace, pride, and self-respect. In my book, I discussed it as a child, I recall looking at my mother and thinking she was one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen. And I knew I wanted to be just like her. Eventually, I'd become determined to address the misconceptions about Africa and the contributions of the continent and the diaspora to the history and, de and the development of the world. A part of my family's story includes the fire bombing of our family home on Valentine's Eve. When our home was firebombed, with, you know, where my father was living with his wife and us children, it was the, the eve of Valentine's Day. You know, that's, you know, that's pretty cowardly. And that's one week before my father was to be assassinated. And so at the time of my father's martyrdom on February 21st, 1965, my mother, a young woman just in her 20s, was left widowed, penniless, homeless, terrified, badgered, harassed, and a mother of four babies while pregnant with my youngest twin sisters. But you see, this woman, this one individual, refused to accept defeat or limitations. She was the wife of El Haj Malik Al Shabazz, Malcolm X. And she would never accept no or I can't as an answer. With faith in God and the true knowledge of her history, my mother, this one individual, raised six daughters single handedly and became a role model for single mothers. And this just goes to show the power that we possess, each one of us. After receiving her PhD with six girls, and she didn't have all, Dr. Betty Shabazz accepted the professorship at Mega Evers College because in her words, she was concerned about the plight of her people and could empathize with those struggling to take care of their families and to make ends meet. So I'm t sharing this with you so that it can, you know, they can serve as role models to show that these are all the things that we can do. She was sincere and humanitarian. She understood true brother and sisterhood. She could have gone anywhere, but she chose a position where she could best serve others. And with the fierce determination that would not let her sit at home because bills had to be paid, and tuition, camp tutors, and private lessons were needed for her six children without grants, loans, or government assistance, my mother would not accept defeat or limitations or her, for herself or her six daughters. And she was steadfast in her commitment to social justice. She often said to me, Ilyasa, my name is Ilyasa Shabazz, said, Ilyasa, just as one must drink water, one must give back. And with that same determination and commitment, my mother took her place in the human rights movement, serving as a role model because in the cause of social justice, serving as a role model in the cause of empowerment, valuing family, teaching true history, and standing up against discrimination and oppression for others because she saw herself in each of you. And so I'm more correct to say that like my father and my mother, President Barack Hussein Obama is willing to sacrifice personal goals and individual freedom on our behalf. That he operates from a core belief in individual responsibility and accountability for affecting change that we're needed. And that he is committed to empowering all people and that he is able to build coalitions across lines of gender, age, race, geography, and religion. And he is genuinely respected by world leaders. 
Sometimes people forget that by the time of his 30s, a young Malcolm had earned the respect of world leaders. By the time of his 30s, Brother Malcolm had garnered support for his initiatives from 33 heads of African states. And most of these 33 heads were assassinated. You know, they, all, all kinds of things happened to them. These world leaders supported my father's plan to bring the United States government up on charges before the United Nations for trampling the human rights of African Americans. But some of you don't know that he was following in the footsteps of his father, Reverend Earl Little. So he didn't go to jail and become this new person. He was able to reflect on his childhood and the values that were instilled in him by his parents. My grandfather Earl had been assassinated in the 1920s for gathering names on a petition to bring the US upon the exact same charges before the League of Nations, which was the predecessor organization to the United Nations. So his, he carried on as his father. Grandfather Earl and grandmother Louise were Garveyites. In my book, I discuss that one of my greatest concerns about the way my family's history is told is the distorted picture that's given of my father's early family life. One distortion is that before my father went to prison and discovered the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that he was an illiterate deviant who could barely sign his name. To some degree, the autobiography is responsible for this, for making Hajj, everything my father did was for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. The autobiography was completed after my father's assassination and three of the final chapters were strangely omitted. My father, who was devoted to Elijah Muhammad during the first run of the autobiography and on his life, sacrificed acknowledgement of his own intelligence and his family's educational and moral influence. But the truth is Reverend Earl and Louise Norton Little were dignified, moral, well-read, and well-educated citizens who promoted literacy, accountability, responsibility, and leadership ideals in their children, and Malcolm and his siblings, just as we are to do for our children. It was his parents, his mother coming from Grenada, who spoke five different languages, was an educated woman, and the recording secretary for the Garvey movement that commanded millions of followers. And his father was an activist. He was six foot five, a self-sufficient man. He was a Baptist minister from Georgia who was also an officer in Garvey's organization. Both Earl and Louise met in Canada at a Garvey rally. In fact, it was Reverend Earl Little, Malcolm's father, who helped to get Marcus Garvey out of prison for supposed mail fraud in the 1920s. And he would bring his son, Malcolm, his young son with him, to rallies and meetings. Malcolm would see his mother writing and reading. She encouraged her children to read the dictionary from beginning to end. So in the movie, it says that Professor Vans, or whatever this man's name is, came to him and encouraged him to read the dictionary. But this, is, this came from his family. And you see, they try to make it seem as though Malcolm's, grand, uh, Malcolm's mother was psychotic and the grandfather was not much. And, and even in the movie, Malcolm was illiterate, eyes wants to be. And there's nothing wrong talking like that if you don't have you know, the, the basic skills. You don't have someone to give you the foundation, but you know, he said, I wants to be a lawyer when I grow up. Grow up. And you know, my, my, my grandparents made sure you know, they were involved in his life, like we should be involved in our children's life. But their family, you know, because it said that Malcolm was this magical man instead of Malcolm was a man of, you know, who had the influence of, of, of good, great black people, you know? But their family life was cut short by the KKK, oh, brother left already, the Ku Klux Klan assassinating his father and the local authorities stepping in to place his mother in an institution and then seizing their lands in Omaha, Nebraska. But before young Louise, Malcolm's mother went to this institution, she rallied the support of her fellow Garveyite Caribbean friends and asked the Lions, Kings, and McGuire's, which is mentioned in the autobiography, she asked them before they supposedly took this woman who had lost all you know, scruples to uh, take care of her children, should these people come back and take me away? Could you please make sure you raise my children with the values that are important to us? And so clearly when you have two conscious activists as were young Earl and Louise, you ensure that your children are equally conscious and equipped to be leaders in the movement for social justice. You see, it was Malcolm's parents that passed the baton on to Malcolm X. That is why Malcolm was able to increase the membership of less than 500 members of the Nation of Islam in 1952 to well over 300,000 by the time of his death in 1965. That is why he was able to restore the foundation his parents provided for him as a child. That is how he came to the understanding, as he said, regarding 
Africans of the diaspora that we can never get civil rights in America until our human rights are restored. So it wasn't about the civil rights agenda, it was about the human rights agenda. And that's what internationalized the, 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 um, you know, the mistreatment or the illegal crime committed against African people and the diaspora. And so I know that Grandfather Earl, Grandmother Louise, Dr. Betty, and Brother Malcolm are coming to an end would be particularly pleased to see the unprecedented expanse of greetings and well wishes to President Barack Hussein Obama from leaders around the world. They would also be elated that leaders with interests as distinct and diverse from Kenya, South Africa, Palestine, Pakistan, Iran, Afghan, France, European Commission, Germany, and the list goes on, that they recognize that this American president possesses the integrity and compassion and courage of his convictions to assist them with meeting the needs and resolving conflicts around the globe. A question I'm often asked is, what would Malcolm, would Malcolm X stand with President Obama? Anyone who understands Brother Malcolm, anyone who reads and clearly understands his and her history, knows that Brother Malcolm would certainly applaud President Obama's initiatives, because you saw on CNN, they said this whole thing where they, you know, they were excluding, excluding Malcolm from any of the uh, celebration that he wouldn't support President Obama and all this not nonsense. We in America have followed through because he was Muslim had followed through with the movement for social justice to usher in an unprecedented opportunity for unity and peace in the world and an unprecedented opportunity for growth and change in America. It's been a long time coming, and many have paid the ultimate price in the movement. And so yes, my father would stand with President Obama and encourage us to fulfill our life's purpose and join the ongoing movement. We have to make sure the movement continues. We can't just sit back and say, oh, that was in the 60s, times have changed, you know, we're doing good, and all that kind of stuff. The movement continues, and if it's at a standstill, it's because we're not doing our job. We're not stepping in and li living these purpose-driven lives that we were created to, to, to live. And if we don't understand about our ancestors, we're not going to know that this is what we're supposed to do. We're not born just to exist and enjoy, but to contribute while we're existing and enjoying. Um, for freedom, equality, and justice for all of humanity. We've elected President Obama, we have, but we haven't arrived. We know we haven't arrived because too many of, our, of us are either homeless or facing mortgage closures. Too many are chronically ill without adequate health care. Too many of us, too many of our households are not headed by men. And too many of our children are uneducated, miseducated, dropping out of school and going to jail in staggering numbers. We have not arrived, and the struggle is far from over. Yes, my father would encourage us to stand with President Obama in support of his programs and initiatives, and he would encourage us to stand with each other, accountable to one another, fulfilling our purpose. But I must implore that we must take full advantage and do our individual and collective parts while President Obama is in office. We really have to take advantage of this. Each one of us, we cannot sit back and think he will do it for us. Each one of us must do our part now. Then we will stand together in power. We will stand together worthy to honor the legacies of Imhotep, Joseph, Queen Nzinga, Queen of Sheba, Solomon, Cleopatra, and Ramses, all of whom gave to humanity, all of whom contributed to history. We will stand to say thank you to Kwame Nkrumah, Patrice Lumumba, Stephen Biko, and Nelson and Winnie Mandela. We will stand to honor two St. Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, David Walker, Harriet Tubman, and Fannie Lou Hamer. The list goes on and on because this is what we're supposed to be doing. Let all of us stand with George Washington Williams, Drusilla Dungy Houston, and if we don't know who they are, we should go and find out. Sheikh Anta Dio, Carter G. Woodson, John Henry Clark, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Sister Coretta Scott King. We will stand and thank Marcus Garvey, Reverend Earl, and Louise Norton Little. Let us stand with El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, and Dr. Betty Shabazz. Let us stand together. Let us stand. Let us stand because we are the change that we seek. Thank you. Okay, can I hear it again for Sister Yas? Okay, can I hear it again for Sister Yas?
Okay, can I hear it again for Sister Ilyas? Okay, can I hear it again for Sister Ilyas?